Uh, again, welcome. I'm Lisa Erdely. I'm one of your hosts today, along with Tiffany Tang from Bedford. Um, we're so excited to present this webinar to you, um, and we're pleased that you made this time after school hours to join us um, to learn a little bit about the updates uh, that were announced earlier this year from College Board, uh, reflect a little bit on the 2019 exam, and think about um, what happened there, and, and ask some questions um, that you might have uh, about the changes and about the exam, and, and think forward to next year in 2020. So I'd like to welcome, before we get going, our three fabulous authors. Uh, we have Renee Shea, who is most recently um, a professor and, uh, of English and Rhetoric and Modern Languages at Bowie State University. You all know her and love her as one of the co-authors of The Language of Composition, Literature and Composition, Conversations in American Literature, Advanced Language and Literature, and Foundations of Language and Literature. And that's a tongue twister. <laughs> she has served as a reader, table leader, and question leader for both lit and lang readings, and um, has been the College Board Advisor for AP Language. So she certainly knows her stuff, and we're delighted to have her here. Uh, again, Larry Scanlon, welcome back. Larry is um, a staple of our webinar series. He is um, most retired from Brewster High School, where he taught AP English Language and Literature, um, and is teaching freshman composition at Iona College in New York. Um, those of you that know Larry know he's been a reader and table leader for the language exam for as long as we can remember. I think we're going on almost two decades. Um, and has served on the test development committee as well. Larry has conducted many workshops across the country, and I know a lot of you might know him from that. He's also the co-author of Language of Comp and Lit and Comp. Um, and then we have Megan, our newest member of the author team. Um, Megan's a National Board Certified Teacher. She's been teaching for um, over 10 years. I should probably update your bio, because I think that's closer to 15 now, Megan. Um, and she's received <laughs> many distinctions, um, including National Council of Teachers of English, Teacher of Excellence. Uh, I met her as the president and executive director of the Florida Council of Teachers of English when she was working in Florida. Shout out to our Florida teachers. Uh, but she's now in Mar Maryland at the um, Colonel Zadak Magruder High School, or was, until her most recent um, move where she's doing um, some more work with uh, courses outside of English and um, some more work with the curriculum. Um, she's an AP Lang and Comp teacher and has been for years, and she's the co-author of Language of Composition and our specialist in all things teacher material. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we're excited to learn from you, and no one wants to hear from me anymore, so I'm going to turn it over to um, our fabulous author team. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you, Lisa. Glad to be here. Um, I think we're going to start with the 2019 exam, and uh, I, I, we're going to just have a few reflections on that because um, a little overview here, what we're going to do from then on is to go um, right to the frameworks. And Megan's going to talk a little bit about that and how she's working with her faculty on that and, and in her own classroom. And then Larry's going to be talking about multiple choice. Uh, Megan and I will go to the new scoring rubric. And then we've got a couple little bonus things at the end for you. And uh, we'll try to finish you up by 7 o'clock so you can all have dinner. So Megan, um, and I think, Lisa, did you already explain that if they have questions, they'll be typing them in there? I did and not. Uh, Thank you. There are two places to type in your questions. Um, there's a questions uh, tab you'll see there on the menu. You can submit questions that way. And then there's a chat if you're having you know, immediate needs or audio issues. You can um, shoot them to me that way or you need an answer right away. So either way works. I'll be monitoring both uh, for the duration of the webinar. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, the exam 2019 highlights are, are not particularly um, dramatic. Uh, there are in terms of changes. I mean, there were almost 600,000 exams. That was in one of Trevor's tweets. But then I think it's a little bit lower than that on AP Central. But it's, it's a huge, a huge exam um, uh, population right now, which is very exciting for the, for the students and also for the equity agenda. Uh, a little bit weaker performance this year, um, you know, but but it's all it's really very very similar to what it has been in the past. Um, I think uh, in 19, in um, 2018 it was 10.5 or 6. So you know you still have your bell curve there. I think there were a few more twos this year. Um, the the ratio between twos and fours was, was uh, a little bit um, changed this time with more twos, but again. The pattern is similar. The highest scores were on synthesis, 
um, and then the open argument, and then the close reading. And of course, that's the close reading and multiple choice usually reflects reflects the 21st century text versus 20th versus pre-20th century. And again, on multiple choice, it went from the highest in the 21st to the 20th to the pre-20th century. Because that's going to change um, with the uh, starting in 2020, we'll just talk about that a little bit later. Other comments, if we can go to the next slide, then um, I think Megan, Megan's in charge of the slides. Um, <laughs> You know, everything's an argument is the mantra right now. I mean, for the framework, everything's an argument. And everything's even an argument in literature. So, you know, that's not new. Um, the, these were comments from APAC last year, and these were uh, from the chief reader. So the fact is that, again, students need to know in every one of the three, they have to take positions. Um, all claims must be supported, not merely rephrased or reasserted. And I think the new rubric really will help with that. I think it's very clear what is meant here by support. Um, analyzing the rhetorical situation, especially exigence and audience, is key. We know that, but now exigence has become a, a familiar term for the, the course. I put this in red because throughout the rubric, throughout the advice that, that Trevor Packer gave, also in his tweets about the exam and the chief reader's comments, um, this, con this, this phrase, line of reasoning, is really beginning to appear more and more. Students need to work through the line of reasoning in longer text, not just excerpts from the exam, or not just excerpts from essays that are pieces that appear on the exam. And, and I think that's interesting, because very often what you get on the exam, you don't have quantitative as much, you, you, at least not for the close reading, but you, you have a line of reasoning. So whether it's deduction, induction, however you're talking about it, I think that becomes very important. So we'll continue talking about that during the, during the session. Um, obviously, students should analyze models of effective writing. They need more than in-class exam prompts. I think this is pretty um, familiar to most of us. Ethos requires more sophisticated analysis than simply acknowledging that the speaker is a famous person. You know, that's the whole issue of, you know, whether when President Obama was giving the um, Charleston speech that he wasn't just speaking as the President of the United States, a different kind of ethos. Again, I think most of you probably practiced that already in your classroom. And students need practice analyzing how writers make choices for an indirect audience. This is another term that's coming up repeatedly. And I know Megan's going to be talking about this in something that she's been doing in class. Um, Megan, do you have any other comments? You were at APAC last year. I was not there. Um, and um, do you have anything to add to this? Right. So um, I think that, you know, Elizabeth Wright is the um, outgoing chief reader, and um, there's a new chief reader coming in, but she seems to be picking up Elizabeth's uh, mantle of, you know, this concept of burning the list, um, really getting kids to move away from just throwing a bunch of terminology into their essay and thinking that that's going to earn them a high score. Um, you know, she emphasized that critical thinking is what is most important. And along the same lines, she stated several times that formulaic writing hurts more than it helps. So really trying to encourage teachers to, you know, if they're going to provide some sort of formula for students to approach a particular essay prompt, that that's more of a training wheel step and then those training wheels are removed over the course of the, of the year. Um, she said the name of the game is argument. We mentioned that. And um, that reading is essential. And we know, I think also instinctively, that the kids who read a lot, not, not just nonfiction, but fiction as well, tend to also um, be some of our better critical thinkers. And that's, that's a long, game. You know, that's, you can't just solve, um, not that it's a problem, but that's something that requires a year-long effort of getting kids to read more and think more critically. Um, so it really is about every single day 
getting kids to read and think and write. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think a number of these comments will lead us right into where we're going with the frameworks and how things are changing somewhat, and then in other instances, actually changing quite a bit. Um, Megan's going to lead the discussion here because um, part of Megan's new job is that she, now she bargained to make sure she would have a class. That I love, that she didn't bargain <laughs> not to have a class. She bargained to have a class. <laughs> So she got to get her AP learning class, but she's doing professional development. So she's working with her all of the English teachers at her at her school, which is a pretty big school in Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and so um, I I thought she would be a natural here to talk about how she and her faculty are approaching these frameworks, both in AP, but also they're obviously going to have uh, repercussions and roots in the earlier classes. So take it away, Megan. All right, so thank you, Renee. Um, yeah, so I am a staff development teacher, and uh, that, that's my new position this year, and it seems important to me anyway that I should be um, walking the walk if I was going to talk the talk. So I um, wanted to make sure I was still in the classroom, plus that's my happy place. You know, I mean, I like the new job, but my happy place is teaching this course. Um, and so that's been a really wonderful thing. I'm also the AP coordinator, so I've had this experience like on the other side with all these new college board changes on the registration side, and um, that's been an interesting story. But that's for a different webinar and a different day. Um, today I wanted to, as Renee said, talk about how the unit guides are informing our instruction in AP Lang, but also uh, in AP Lit, and even on a school-wide basis, how we can use the, if not the frameworks, then also the rubrics to support student writing at all levels. So one of the uh, things that I wanted to mention, um, I attended a session by Kevin McDonald and Brandon Abden, um, and they had these bullet points to say, um, I think what really stuck out to me was that second bullet point to make sure that we show students, as Renee mentioned, this, this phrase keeps popping up, a line of reasoning in full-length text, not just small passages that they'll see on the exam, uh, because the kids need to see how an idea is developed throughout an entire passage, in part, so that if they're given just, just the introduction to a speech or just the conclusion to a speech, they can include that awareness of the function of an introduction or the function of a conclusion as part of their analysis. So I thought that was really may, interesting. Um, may I? May I sure, jump yeah, in for Larry. a second? Yeah, Absolutely. I just want to say that's so important because we all have to realize that the course is so much larger than the exam. Of course, we're focus, mm -hmm. focusing on the exam, but the the exam itself is a test. It's an artificial instrument that's designed to measure performance. But we hope that teachers will not be using small passages throughout the year um, in, in exam prep. So I, I think that's a crucial point, and I'm glad that Kevin and Brandon you know, made that, and that you are as well. Thank well, Larry, you. I'm going to I'm going to jump in here because I mentioned to my colleagues earlier on that um, my grandson has just started um, college at at Denison here in um, Ohio, where I live now, and I asked him if his AP Lang class was really helping him with freshman comp, and he said, well, kind of, but he said it was really helping him in his political theory class and in an ethics class. And he commented on the fact that his his teacher in Charlottesville, Virginia, where he took AP Lang, emphasized the critical reading, close reading of longer text, and that that's the thing that, that he feels has given him a, a good foothold. So it's always good to know that. Um, and I certainly agree with the full length text. OK. OK. So. Um the, the last bullet point there, too, I think, you know, we're all on the same page where this, this course is bigger than just the exam. And so I appreciated that they said that students need to write more than just in-class essays, right, to learn the moves that professional writers use. And I really appreciate the language there. It's um, the same kind of phrasing 
from uh, Kenny Piddle's book with um, Kelly Gallagher about the moves a writer makes. And I think that's a, just a beautiful expression. And I've been using that a lot more with my students this year. You know, what are the moves that uh, this author of this textbook uses to analyze you know, the King's speech, for example? Um, so I liked that language as well. OK. So thinking about these units and what they represent and how they connect to our planning, I appreciate that for me, the units feel very natural. Um, I think that they really reaffirm the approach that most AP Lang teachers already take. And so when I look at the units, you know, unit one and unit two, I feel comforted that, okay, we, we still have to start with introducing the rhetorical situation, right? We still need to teach our students the, the fundamental basic elements of the rhetorical situation, and then we build on that throughout the year. Um, one thing that I did, you know, most of us are used to using the, the College Board acronym for the rhetorical situation SOAPs, right? But now with this uh, introduction or reintroduction of exigence as a term, I reworked that acronym to be this word spaces. So I've got the same elements, but basically I broke apart, which is really, I, I think, a great move um, for the course, to the breaking apart of like that bulky term occasion into exigence and context. So I've got spaces, so it's speaker, purpose, audience, context, exigence, and then subject. Um, so that seemed to be working well with students. You know, I showed them the, the graphic version that's in the textbook of the triangle with the circle around it. You know, that's your visual. So then here's this acronym to help you remember these elements. Um, we also, since the start of the school year, have really been talking really a refresher on persuasive appeals. Um, most ninth and 10th graders are introduced to those terms. But as Renee mentioned earlier, my work is really to push kids beyond just identifying, oh, this, you know, this section here is ethos. OK, well, but what's the strategy behind it? So um, I, this year, used two of the passages from the textbook, uh, the King, King George's speech and the J.D. Vance excerpt, both of which this are very short and accessible. They're really wonderful for using at the beginning of the year um, because so many kids, even if even if they're weaker um, in rhetorical analysis, they can they can um, find something to hold on to in those texts as you introduce these concepts. And then because of this very kind of clear and obvious move toward really getting kids to think about um, texts that have a specific audience and uh, specific exigence, I've been trying to bring in texts that you know, meet those criteria. So around September 11th, uh, my students and I looked at President Bush's speech that he gave at that time and compared it to John Stewart's testimony um, that was recent. And we looked at specifically how um, Stewart kind of called forth and, and echoed the sentiments that Bush laid out in his speech um, following September 11th. So that was a really powerful kind of, and the timing of it, there was, there was exigence for the selection of those texts. But it was a really powerful comparison. And we could really talk about the audience and this context and all of that. Um, as well as purpose, obviously. And then the flip side of having a very specific audience would be this idea that students still need to analyze for an indirect audience. And so we looked at Gladwell's essay, The Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted. And all of this kind of fell under this larger thematic umbrella of activism and how do people, how do people inspire others through their language? How do you inspire um, public policy change? So that's kind of like the essential question that's threaded its way 
through all of these texts, but we're using them to analyze every, what connects back to um, specifically audience and exigence. Megan, how are you defining indirect audience? Is that the unforeseen audience, or is that a secondary audience, or how do you convey that to students um, so that they don't feel like they're just guessing? Right. Um, I, you know, I used to, I like the term indirect, I used to use the term um, immediate, or the terms immediate audience and remote audience, but I actually think I, I like indirect, I think it's a better term. Um, but yeah, the idea that you, um, that you are writing for a, a particular, you know, maybe college educated individuals or, you know, something that's like a, a broad group of people, you know, maybe it's a particular type of person that subscribes to a magazine. But yeah, I think unseen or just, um, <clears throat> not more, I don't know, I, don't, I guess maybe just more general or um, not having like a specific set of characteristics. Does that make sense? Is that how you would describe it, Renee? Yeah, I mean, I, I always think about that when um, it's, it's easy enough to say I'm giving a speech to the people in this auditorium, but this day and age I'd be, you know, if somebody's you know, videoing me immediately uh, that I may not know right. about, but someone's also probably videoing me, um, you know, uh, because that's what we do. Um, right. And always keeping that in mind that my, my immediate audience is the readers of the New York Times or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But then the, you know, the indirect audience will be other people who I'm not specifically targeting, but who I keep in mm -hmm. mind. I, I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of how, as a student, I would I would be able to do that. Um, and it's mm -hmm. I think it's hard. I think that's why they're they're um, the college boards called that out. And I think that's something mm -hmm. to really think about in 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 those terms. I mean, with MLK, for example, we know who his specific audience was, the clergy. But then he also knew that there would be these mm -hmm. other audiences because he was a public figure. So um, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's harder than others. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, that's a nice go-to example, I think. And then ultimately students will often say, well, the, the uh, eventual audience is, of course, AP students, even though it wasn't the intended. But uh, that would be one of the indirect um, audiences. Okay. You know, whatever's beyond the immediate and not particularly intended by mm -hmm. the occasions and exigents. But uh, it's, it's all a rather complicated business when we try to define it outside of mm -hmm. the situation itself when we're teaching. I think it's much easier then because we can we can just see it in, in, in context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think to Renee's point too, some uh, a lot of uh, the conversation about audience nowadays, well, even back then, but certainly now, um, connects to this idea of the, the mode, right, or the medium through which the message is spread, and that's really important um, to consider. So, I know it's so much fun. I love, I love. We could just talk all day long, but we need to actually move forward if we're going to stay on time. So, I'm going to change the slide, um, and I do have some other kind of ideas that I'll share later. But I, I want to change the slide so that we make sure to um, have enough time to talk about multiple choice because I know there are a lot of questions about multiple choice, and I'm actually excited to hear what Larry has to say about this as well. No, this oh, is a big, this oh. is the biggest, the <laughs> biggest, yeah. the yeah. most significant so change, I think. <laughs> yeah, there, there are some pretty significant changes. Uh, so for next year, we'll have um, five passages. Uh, two of them will be reading passages, as it says here, for rhetorical analysis, and there will be, well, there'll be 45 questions, and the reason that there will be 45 and not, say, 54 to 57, the way it used to be, is that the questions of the second type, the writing questions, even though they won't actually be writing, of course, take longer to do. So the 45 questions will be 45%, one each. So that means that there'll be 23 to 25 um, questions on two reading passages, 
and then 20 to 22 on writing passages. Now, the, the reading passages um, will have, say, the two on part one, and then the passage for the rhetorical analysis on part two. So there will be three on the exam. It's highly likely that one of those three will be an older text, but we don't know where that, that will be. All right, so I just, I don't want to make any predictions, but that's the way it, it's going to look, okay? Um, then we have the writing questions. Um, there'll be one longer and two short passages, and all of the questions for both the reading and the writing will assess the four big ideas. And I'll start right away by saying uh, for the passages, well, for both of them, there will no longer be questions on um, annotated material with footnotes or, or uh, endnotes, etc. There will no longer be questions that depend on the knowledge of vocabulary. As my friend and former chief reader Mary Traxel has said, um, we'll avoid, teach our students to avoid language that mystifies everyday experience. Ethos, logos, pathos, legos, well, she didn't say that. That's the one I say at the end. But uh, ascendanton, et cetera. We want them to understand all of these concepts, but not use the terms. So the questions now for um, all of these will will um, be from 11 to 14 on the rhetorical situation, including you know the audience, the speaker, exigence, which it, it is a little troublesome because it's a new word to many of us, but it. it, it Exigence is what arises out of the occasion. I think if we start that way, we'll, we'll understand it. And then 13 to 16 on claims and evidence, 13 to 16 on reasoning and organization. So those sections are the central. Um, and on style, 11 to 14. Now, for the that's for the reading. And then for the writing, as you can see, I put here 11 to 14, et cetera. Okay? So these seconds, type, uh, we're going to take a look at a few now. And I'll say that in the CED, which I've learned is the name for course and exam description in the binder, we have seven questions of the new type. Um, what we're looking Larry, at now. Let, yeah. Larry, excuse me. Can you explain where the what the source of the writing passages will be? I mean the reading yeah, passages um, the reading passages right. are published uh, you know, pieces yeah, the, from, from different centuries. Yeah, the reading passages will be very much like what we had for forever. The writing passages are non-professional, non. In other words, they're likely to be written by the test committee, and um, we have now seven of them on our website. Uh, and these are a bear to write um, because they have to be pretty good but not great. They are passages for revision, and all of the questions will address the features according to the four big ideas. Um, so, it, it, well, I won't talk too much about the process of writing, but we have over 60, 60 or 70 questions on seven um, passages uh, up there. So here's the first one. And if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, this a little more clearly. Okay. So here we have a passage on tiny houses, and it's very short, and I, I, we think, because we're not positive yet, that this will be like one of the shorter ones uh, coming up on the exam. Okay, so if we have, say, 11 questions or so um, uh, on, on these passages, this, this will be you know, part of that. So we have, let's see. Um, let's go now to the next one, please. Okay, so for example, question one. Um, which of the versions of sentence three, reproduced below, expresses the writer's ideas most clearly and succinctly? Now, I'm not going to read all of these. It would take us uh, more than the rest of our time. But the mo important thing about these as we would do with the ones in the binder, is to go through and try to determine which of the four big ideas each of these addresses. This one addresses reasoning 
and um, um, yeah, reasoning and organization, and but also style. And we'll notice many of them address more than one of the big ideas, but primarily this would address the first one. Okay. Now um, let's go to the next one. Here we have, um, the writer wants to add a sentence, these homes often feature extremely efficient use of space and have compact essentials like smaller appliances in order to illustrate some of the advantages of tiny houses. Which of the following choices indicates the most logical placement of this sentence? Okay, so the students would have to figure out, well, where logically would this information best support the writer's intent and composition. This one addresses mainly reasoning and understand and organization, but it also relates to the point being made, so it relates to claims and evidence as well. Okay. Um, so, and Larry, move. this is very similar to an SAT question. Yes, uh, yes, but I, I think and I haven't looked at those that carefully, to, to be honest. But I think here we have many more questions that really look at the relationship between claims and evidence than we do mm -hmm. there. Um, the ones that address reasoning and organization and style, I think, resemble those more than these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as we we'll notice, we have just five here that we're going to show you today of the 60 or so that are on the website. Um, so here, here's, uh, here's the third, and let's take a look. It says, after the addition of the sentence indicated in question two, these homes often feature extremely efficient use of space and have compact essentials like smaller appliances, the writer wants to revise sentence six, reproduced below, to provide transition from the second to the third paragraph. Okay, which of the following versions of sentence six would best achieve this purpose? Now, we have to admit that if you look at the, um, the seven questions, um, no, the nine, the que nine questions that are available in the binder, that you know, many of these we've modeled on those, but we've tried to imagine what many of the others would be like too, so we have 60, uh, made up on the nine, but this one is very much like one of the ones in, in, in there, where the kids have to understand the writer's intent. So it involves, of course, the rhetorical situation, but it really addresses reasoning and understanding. And um, Larry, this, this also seems it just would require a great deal of very deep reading at, at that, you know, about coherence also. I mean, there's logic, well, but it's also yeah, definitely that, that addresses, Yeah, thanks, Renee. And that, that addresses, of course, the relationship between these test questions and our teaching. Um, I, we would hope, of course, that these questions will not suggest that this will be the way to teach writing. I think what we all need to do is take a look and try to determine what each of the questions purports to assess. And the, the four big ideas are very helpful here. And then, as we teach, we make sure that those components are the major features that we focus on when we teach, when we assign, when we discuss reading, when we have students write drafts, starting with paragraphs and when we have them revised. If we focus on all of those, then, you know, if, if our practice is larger than the test, then the students should do all right with, with these. Um, this is a new type of assessment, but it doesn't really suggest a new type of writing, we hope. Okay, um, I just wanted to say, though, that if we go back to the CED, the binder, um, we have seven, nine questions of the new type, okay? And of those, one addresses the rhetorical situation, 
what for address the uh, reasoning in a, an organization. Four of them address the relation claims and evidence, and there are no style questions. Now, we have two passages in the binder, in the CED. One is of the, you know, the old type of reading uh, question, where, where the four big ideas are distributed a little more widely. But um, here we have, as I say, in the, in the binder, only nine. So I'm expecting, and of course we should expect, that these four big ideas will be distributed more widely over the questions that are available. Um, okay, so now you'll notice that we have, among ours, we have reasoning and, and organization for three of them, and one of them addresses style as well. Now, um, here we have the next one. Thank you. Someone uh, switched the slide. To strengthen the point made in sentences seven and eight, seven to eight, the writer wants to make the paragraph more persuasive. Which of the following choices would achieve this pur purpose? Now here we have five suggestions, not quoting anything from uh, the text, but th that address what kind of evidence and information a student would, uh, or the writer would add in order to strengthen the argument. So this one addresses pretty specifically claims and evidence. So the students, you know, would a comparison do it? Would anecdotal information do this? Would suggesting alternative spaces do it? Would imparting more information do it? Or including a floor plan, etc. So. Um, when you get to the answers to the key, you'll, you'll discover that one of them is actually the correct answer, if we went back to the passage as well. OK. Um, now, next. All right. Again, another that addresses um, claims and evidence um, primarily, but not only that. So let's see. The writer wants to add information to reinforce the point introduced in sentences 9 and 10. Which of the following would best accomplish this goal? Questioning the importance of the needs, adding to the list, balancing convenience and other considerations, clarifying time-sensitive nature, using more substantive examples. Now, first of all, this addresses claims and evidence. But at the same time, does it not address reasoning and organization? And it depends on how the information is integrated. It would also um, address style. Now, in many, in the other, um, this is one, as I said, of seven that we have on the website. And we do have, of course, for this short one, for the purposes of tonight's webinar, we couldn't be this very exhaustive. But if you look at the others, you'll see that we have questions that address the rhetorical situation for many of them, many questions, and also um, many style questions. Um, and I'm not sure if um, it would be necessary that teachers try writing these passages. Um, it wouldn't hurt and write the, uh, the answers, make them. Um, I would not, as I, I it's a practice of mine of having students actually attempt to write multiple choice questions to the reading passages from published, you know, fine examples of writing, write multiple choices uh, questions so as to, you know, get inside the test makers' heads, but also to understand very carefully the fine distinctions that we look for in close reading. But I don't think I would have them uh, do this. What the, um, the most important thing, though, here, for us, when we look at these questions, is again to understand what the question asks, and essentially, you know, what it assesses. That's that's the most important feature. Um, but Larry, in yeah, these, jump in. In some of the other passages, there will be. This one is is just pretty straightforward. This one, and yeah. there aren't quotations or anything like that. But there are passages that will be evidence based. Right, so there would be questions about 
the commentary yeah. and questions about the things that we're seeing yeah. in the rubric. Yeah, for example, we have um, we have one on um, uh, the yeah. electoral college. Um, oh, yeah. Along, with uh -huh. we have one on um, the use of plastic bags. We have one on autonomous cars. So some of them are pretty straightforward and informational, like this one. Some of them, uh, although they do all present an argument, um, some of right, them are much right. more complex with references and quotations, etc. Some right. of the longer ones. Yeah, especially um, the two longer ones on uh, electoral college plastic bags, and one on political elections in general. And there's one other I can't think of the top of my head what it's about, but we have seven. Um, yeah, and they they they're you know pretty I won't say exhaustive, but I think uh, pretty comprehensive. Um, and, and these are on the Bedford website, but on yeah. the Starting in the spring, they will be in the in the back of it, it, actually the, you know there are sample exams in the back of the of the language yeah. competition and, and this will be in there with the with the um, the printing that comes out in the spring. Yeah, we also have um, you know full answer keys with rationales for each of them, mm -hmm. which I think will, will be a really good thing. So I'll just uh, warn any any teacher who wants to write these realize that you have to write a passage that's okay and then you start to write questions and then every time there's a question you have to go back and change the passage it, it's a neat challenge try it but but the most important thing I think is that we will, should continue to teach good writing and remember that these are assessment tools not teaching models we, if we use the backward design, understanding by design model, and we take the four basic big ideas and then move them into our writing teaching, well, teaching of writing, of course, we, you know, we all naturally do that, but I mean in a more focused way, I think students will be ready for this. Um, because the binder, the framework, it contains a framework, but the teacher, is the one who's in charge of the course and the curriculum. Nice. Yeah, Larry, power to the teacher. I like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the, the insight and the inspiration. I'm going to switch the slide to um, uh, <laughs> Renee. <yeah. laughs> yes. Yeah. But those, you know, the rubric is so, I mean, the, the multiple choice in the rubric, I know the rubrics for the essays, but boy, you can really start to see how the rubric is, in order to do well on the essay exams, those multiple choice kind of break it down into some very, very specific kinds of things. Um, we know, I said this is the new, new rubric because the College Board revised the old new rubric, and I understand, and there's been quite a lot of um, discussion on it on the um, on the AP Lang web um, Facebook page but the new new rubric was the rubric that was put out to start with apparently was revised as a result of a lot of uh, feedback the college board received and particularly suggestions from the APSI the summer Institute leaders who were working with teachers um, to acquaint them with this rubric so right now, uh, I think the rubric, which, and I have to say, I really like the six-point rubric. I, I will say that. I worked with assessment for many different kinds of exams over many, many, many years. The nine-point was quite lovely, this holistic idea, when the course was a small group. You had a, people you know, a couple hundred people reading, teachers and professors reading the exams, it's gotten so large that that, you know, holistic concept in one through nine, I think it's unwieldy, and I know the psychometricians have said that for some time. So I think the six-point rubric is a really good teaching um, tool, and I think will will help us to teach writing and also to just help the kids understand the the basis of their of the assessment a little bit um, more specific. The old one had a bit of the William O. Douglas 
the comment about pornography, that he couldn't define it, but he knew it when he saw it. And this one, everything is very, very carefully defined. So the categories for each question are, I'm just going to go over this briefly, and then Megan is going to pick up because she's been working with her uh, faculty colleagues on the new rubric on how they're integrating it into their classroom. But I don't think Megan had a chance since this just came out on Monday to work with the new new rubric. <laughs> Nonetheless, there are <laughs> categories for each question. The thesis is going to be one point. Evidence and commentary is four points. I put commentary in red just as I put line of reasoning in red throughout because I think the commentary is absolutely key here. And that's of many of the questions. If you go back to the questions Larry was just discussing, some of those questions have to do with what commentary would be added. So that's, again, the second big idea. And then sophistication, there's the one, again, where it gets a little, you know, it's not as clear exactly what sophistication means. I'm sorry, is, is somebody talk? OK. Um, also, uh, there, the College Board is going to be conducting a webinar on this. I assume it will be open to those of you who are registered and um, with it through the audit and, and the like. And that is, uh, I think, Megan, is it the 28th of October from uh, at 6 o'clock? Yeah. Here, I'll flip to that really quickly. There is the information. I just, I literally copied and pasted this information from email I received from the College Board. So, oh, okay. yeah, it's the October 28th, but they're doing several of the webinars, um, uh -huh. but the first one is October 28th. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm sure that will okay. be very helpful, but if we can just go back. I'll go over a couple of things that you'll see all the time. So now the the actual exam will will specify to kids what what are the criteria that um, are being used to measure your performance? Respond to the prompt with a thesis that presents a defensible position. This is in the synthesis question. Select and use evidence from at least three of the provided sources to support your line of reasoning. And there we have that again. And and we know that that the three sources are are what we've what we're accustomed to. Indicate clearly the sources used through direct quotation. Sources may be cited as, and that's the thing as as we've already seen on the exam. Explain how the evidence supports your line of reasoning. I probably should put that whole line in red because, again, the I, I believe these instructions are really helpful to get to the, uh, the, the chief weakness of student responses to synthesis was that the sources overwhelmed the student voice. And so here, I think the scoring guide and the instructions and then the rubric also are really helpful to explain to the kids what that means. You know, here, if you do this, you're not going to be overwhelmed by the sources. You will, in fact, make your position central because your position is your line of reasoning. So that's going to take, I think that will be very good instruction. And then use appropriate grammar and punctuation in communicating your argument. And that will be the same on all three questions. So if we go to question two, then, it's quite similar, a thesis that analyzes the writer's rhetorical choices, again, linking to the prompt, select and use evidence to support your line of reasoning, explain how the evidence supports your line of reasoning, again, very similar, but the evidence there is not from sources, it's from the text, and then demonstrating an understanding of the rhetorical situation, so that's actually pulled out as a very important element, and again, one of the big ideas and then grammar. So we'll go on to question three then, which is the open argument, so to speak. Respond to the prompt with a thesis that presents a defensible position. Uh, provide evidence, explain how the evidence supports and use appropriate grammar. So the instructions are very similar. A few details changing of, that will target specific questions something like the rhetorical situation. You must address the rhetorical situation or you will not get the credit that you want on, the, on, the, uh, on this rubric. But otherwise, I think the students will become accustomed to this. And this becomes a checklist for them. Granted, you have to kind of explain what that means, how the evidence supports your line of reasoning. Look at different examples and models. But there it is. So um, those are the instructions. So now we get to the rubric. And we've got slides that kind of go through the rubric, but we obviously don't have the whole rubric here. 
So Megan, you want to move on? Well, the next slide actually goes to the webinar instructions. I think we had a link. We had a link to the rubric, but we, um, I think we cut the slides because we knew we wouldn't have enough time because there's never enough time. Um, can I jump in instead and just talk about a couple of things that Please I've do. been doing? So with right. right. So I, um, we uh, had a department meeting a couple of weeks ago, and our department chair also teaches AP Lang. So um, one of the activities that we did as a department, because our, our goal is to, you know, we want every student to be college and career ready, and we want them, if we're able to, help them take AP courses in high school so they can earn that college credit um, before leaving high school. That's our goal. So um, as a department, we actually looked at the rubric. I, I led that part of the discussion um, where we just sort of talked about the different elements and how, pe how students would receive points and this and that. And then we actually engaged in a norming activity. Um, and what's funny, I mean, we, we were doing this before these student samples. Now it's much, it would have been much easier now. Um, that they provided all of these student samples, um, but we didn't know when that was coming. And so it was a really great co professional conversation to look at student writing and apply the rubric. And what was comforting, certainly for those of us who teach AP um, in the department, is that all of us really were achieved a consensus on the, the scores for the different essays, even even those essays that were being scored by teachers who don't teach AP. Um, so I think that there's a lot of um, kind of validity in the usefulness of the scoring rubric um, that that you could sit down with a department and do some norming and really come out, you know, everyone coming out with the same scores. Um, I think says a lot for the rubric itself. So that's one of the ways that we use it. And, and I'd like to be able to take um, especially the synthesis rubric and share that with other departments because other departments use, you know, they engage in synthesis with their students as well. And so I think there's some um, kind of common language that can exist across the school using those rubrics. So, so that's one of the things that we've done so far. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more we can do as the year goes on, um, but that's what we've done so far. So I think Renee, unless you wanted, or Larry wanted to add any other comments about the rubric, we'll switch to I'll some of say, the ideas um, you wanted to share. Yeah, Larry? Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment about the, the four big ideas, unless you're going there yourself, Megan. Um, you know, we tend to think of those as, as forming the foundation of all of the multiple choice questions for the reading and writing passages. But it, it's, it's a nice little group of four um, as we, you know, work with our students on their own writing through the year. Because, of course, you know, they have their own rhetorical situation. Um, they, you know, have to be careful about their reasoning, organization, the relationship between claims and evidence. How crucial is that? I don't have to go into that. We all know what I mean there. And they have to uh, attempt to do it with some style. So it's, it's a nice little compact group of four big ideas. Um, unlike literature, they have seven. Oh, they, they, they think they have, they have to have more. And um, actually, you know, I'm glad I didn't confuse them tonight because <laughs> here I am doing a literature session tomorrow and I nearly, nearly <laughs> confused the two. But uh, yeah, so the four is, is kind of just perfect. That's Let awesome. me just say, too, I think the, the way the rubric is being developed is, is really helpful here because if, you, oh. if the new new rubric here, um, but one of the things that, that bothers me a little bit is I know the chief readers talk all the time and we talk all the time uh, and ad making ad all sorts of admonitions against formulaic writing, prescriptive writing. And yet, when the rubric suggests this is an example of a thesis, that's really good. And here's another example. You know, the kid who's not a natural writer or whatever is going to glom onto that and, and, and want to use it. 
But then when you look at the notes now, I'm looking at the one for question two, for instance, it'll say the thesis may be more than one sentence provided the sentences are in close proximity. The thesis may be anywhere within the response. And then it explains what a defensible thesis is. And then it says it may establish this or that. And then under sophistication, it actually gives three ways that a student could get full credit for sophistication. And given the fact that that's one point, you know that that one point is what's going to distinguish. Uh, that, that, that can be very important in terms of how the, the score on the exam itself gets translated into the one to five. So that, I think, is also really useful for kids because sophistication, you say, well, you just have to have some style, or you have to do this or that. The College Board actually says these are possibilities for how Here's you get how, credit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I agree, Renee. Thank you. Yeah. Nicely put. So once we see a lot of student writing, that will be helpful. That, I mean, we need to see it in action. So, all right. Yay. Okay. okay. So we wanted, yay. That was from Lisa. Um, shout out to Lisa <laughs> for providing that. I can tell you something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we wanted to wrap up because we are running out of time, but we feel very strongly, um, the Bedford team, we always feel very strongly about, like, getting ideas out to teachers that they can use immediately right away. Um, so in addition to kind of all of this discussion about the changes and, and hopefully giving you some food for thought and um, some leads on materials you can use, like Larry's amazing multiple voice questions, uh, we also wanted to share, I wanted to share a couple things that I've been doing um, recently and then Renee also had some great ideas. So I'm going to try and like blast through um, Megan, can I just the next, uh, add one yeah, quick thing? I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yeah, um, I do yeah. have a lot of questions here. Some can be answered pretty succinctly, and some I think we can get back to people one-on-one. -on -one. So if you can give me maybe a few minutes at the end, I just want to make sure that the uh, the trends, uh, I, that, I can, that I can ask the questions that keep coming up. Yep, yep. I'm going to say my, I'm going to, this is like one minute long. Um, basically, Greta Thunberg's speech at the United Nations is an incredible speech for students to analyze. And it just so happened, um, in a wonderful stroke of good fortune, that we uh, were reading Letter from Birmingham Jail and studying that. And it's become this wonderful um, kind of parallel text. So, so for three or four days, uh, my students we're looking at, I would ask them a question about one feature of Greta's speech, and we would just, almost like a warm-up activity for the first 10 minutes, and then we'd get back into King. Um, but it's been really interesting to see how both of these uh, people were directing their text to a specific audience, technically, but then, like we've been discussing, uh, they were aware of a much larger um, audience and, and really kind of a historical um, significance of what they had to say. So I put my questions there that I posed to students, you know, feel free to use, take any of them, but it really is a great speech for students to analyze and it was fun to compare it to Birmingham Jail. Um, the other activity kind of building on all of this was um, my students read Gladwell's essay, The Revolution Will Not Be Treated, and so just thinking, kind of trying to build their uh, abilities with analyzing visuals and this concept of you know, synthesizing information. So I said, put yourself in the writer's seat of Gladwell's essay. You know, if, if you were Gladwell, how might you use these images to support his claim that effective activism requires hierarchy, strategy, and discipline? And I included these two pictures, and also there's another great image on um, page 1082 in the textbook of President Obama and President Bush and people marching across um, the bridge at the anniversary. And it was really interesting to see how kids picked up on different elements and could use the visual to support Gladwell's argument. Um, so so those were my those are my really quick really quick ideas. Hopefully that gives you some uh, something to work with. So I'm gonna flip now to Renee. Um. 
All right, and I will be very fast, and that is that we love Pande Wiley. He's in all of our textbooks, I think, and we know that in TLC there's one where he takes a, you know, he has a classical, uh, canonical um, piece of art, and then he has African American men, particularly some. He's also done women, but he puts or he has them choose, and they, and then he does the the. Um, the rendering of that. Of, of, you can talk about whether it subverts stereotypes, how it you know, interrogates masculinity, all sorts of things like that. And of course, we know him even better now because he did President Obama's official portrait. But anyway, he recently, this past weekend, unveiled, and the, uh, let's go to the next slide, if you will, um, Megan. The, the link there is to the, a news article on it. But he unveiled his version, he's, uh, the um, Virginia Museum in Richmond, which has, you know, um, Monument Alley, as it's called. And uh, they asked him to, uh, they commissioned a piece that will be installed in front, of, uh, in front of the museum. Right now it's in Times Square in New York. So he took this original of um, the Confederate General Stewart, and next slide, Megan, and he, <laughs> thank you, and he gave his version of it. He also unveiled it in the way that these monuments used to be unveiled, and that is that he had a parade, and he, it was draped, and he pulled the drape from it, and it was very, um, very interesting how he, how he managed this presentation. And of course, here you have the general is no longer on the horse, but the horse is in the same position, and you have an African-American figure there. Lots and lots to discuss in terms of what Wiley is doing, but also in TLC, there's a, that wonderful essay by um, Mitch Landrieu about why and how the policy changed in New Orleans so that Confederate monuments were actually removed from the city. So again, what's going on right now is a way into and, and just relevant to almost a synthesis essay being um, developed for it right before your eyes there in terms of uh, these monuments and the kinds of um, the kinds of changes we're seeing. So anyway, I, I wanted to offer that as well. Um, so now we will go to some questions. Thank and you, I know Renee. we're leaving closer to seven. So we thank you all for coming. And we will stay and answer questions as long as you are with us. Um, shockingly, we had um, like another 15 or 16 people join <laughs> recently. So. Um, we began, I should say. So we did. We did. <laughs> Here we go. Who's in for the long haul? Um, we did have some people leave. So those that left, I'm not going to um, use their questions unless I feel that they um, expand on someone else's. Um, if there's something really specific or something that we already talked about that may have been already cleared up. I also am not going to bring them up here, but I do have all of your questions. I screenshotted everyone, and um, I should have your email from registering, so we can follow up with you individually if your question, if your specific question isn't answered, because there's a lot of questions here. Um, so I'm just going to begin with that. Um, there's a couple of logistical questions, and one um, specifically that came up a few times. It's for Larry, and it's more of a confirming question. Um, I think Rachel said it best, and she's asking, Larry, did I understand correctly that none of the multiple choice questions will include the style vocabulary, vocabulary like they used to? Um, and then she gave me a few that I need to say and I can't pronounce. <laughs> but instead, ask about the intention or choice with, without the term. Could you confirm? What she wants to know, Lisa, is whether <laughs> chiasmus and zoigma will be on the Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Chiasmus, I knew. The other one, I don't know if I can say. What is that one? Asymmetrical? <laughs> what, what is that? Uh, Antimetaboli or something like oh, that. Oh, antimetaboli. was. A syndicon? I should know that from, from my degree. <laughs> so Larry, what's yeah. your what's your well, final answer on that? Well, antimetabolate is a favorite of mine, and among my favorites is antimetabolate. If I may try to <laughs> actually do one right away, um, those kinds of terms, while fun, will not be among the choices. Now we have to try to figure out, and I think I have, for the most part figure out which of the terms are necessary. You know, imagery, diction, um, syntax, metaphor, um, parallelism, 
the, the everyday terms are, 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 are going to be there. But the ones that, it's all about what the questions are purporting to assess. The questions are not going to be looking for knowledge of vocabulary, rather for the ability to do a close rhetorical reading. So um, if I can't pronounce it, it won't be on the test. You know, that's something Danny Lawrence <laughs> But, um, yeah, the more students understand, for example, the appeals, ethos, logos, and pathos, I would still teach those, but I would tell the kids, don't use those in your, in your writing, or, and, and you won't expect to find them among the answers either. Um, students, unfortunately, fall into the pattern of saying that the writer uses pathos in order to communicate more effectively with his audience, you know, things like that. So uh, rather, have them explain what that appeal does and, and talk about the appeal to the value of something instead of that. But on, to go back to the specific question, on part one, no. The questions will not be asking about those terms. And the other okay. thing is I'm surprised that some teachers don't realize there will no longer be, and there haven't been for years, the questions that have the um, Roman numerals, one, two, three, et cetera. Those are gone options. as well. Options. Options items. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to answer two quick questions just so we can knock a couple of these out, Larry. Um, for those of you that are asking, uh, Bedford did create all of those additional multiple choice questions for that revision question. Those are available mm -hmm. um, through your sales rep or through us. I put my um, email address um, in the chat earlier, but you can email me or uh, probably easier to email HS, like high school, marketing mm -hmm. at BSW, that's B as in boy, F as in Frank, W as in Walter, PUV.com, and we'll send you a link, and you can access all of those multiple choice questions that Bedford um, has put together. And then, um, a couple of people are asking about the uh, the new rubrics. Yes, they came out today. They're on the College Board site. Um, I sent a link in the chat. That's a separate um, thing than the Q&A. Um, if you want to just look at the menu, you'll see that, and I'll try to uh, paste it again individually um, to people that are asking. And then um, a couple other quick questions. Let's see. Um, there's a lot here. <laughs> um, looks like a lot of questions about the student examples, Larry, and where exactly to find those. The which example? The student, uh, the student samples. Student examples. Um, From the college, sure the college right board site. Yeah, the, I college, think yeah. the college board, student examples, and the new resources. Um, so if you go, yeah. I mean, I can answer part of that if someone else wants to chime in. But if you go to the course um, listing on yeah. AP Central and you find the course, you can, you'll see all of the new resources that are posted there. And that's where you, um, you can typically find these kinds of other supports. The rubrics are there, and the um, student resources. I'm not a College Board spokesperson, but I just know where to find them. <laughs> no, I think um, they were just yesterday, in fact, or the day before. Yeah, it's that recent, the new ones. Great. There's a question here. Um, one more clarifying question. Um, the mm -hmm. essay is now worth six points rather than nine. Could you confirm? Yeah. Yeah. Now, how that's um, translated into the one to five with the multiple choice, I'm sure the College Board it will explain. Um, great. Um, I'm going to answer the next one, and then I have a couple more for you all. Um, what resources are you able to offer at this point in addition to the College Board sources? So a lot, um, and I can say this here now that, um, that everything's over, but the College Board was really great in filling publishers in on the new changes. So we were um, in an NDA with them um, since December, and we actually were able to update all of our resources to match the College Board changes, and those are available for everyone at our College Board um, Updates website, where you can find pacing guides and videos explaining all of this um, and links out to get those multiple choice um, pieces that we talked about earlier. And I can paste that link in the um, chat also as soon as I'm done filling these questions. So all of those things are up and they're available for you to use now. Um, another one, any idea what a qualifying score would be on the essay? On the nine-point scale, it was a five. What do you mean a qualifying well, That's, not, that's yeah, not. We can't, can't answer those questions yet. 
and and that's not even necessarily true that it was a five. Right, so, right, exactly, because there was that, yeah. that's what I meant, there's that formula that translates into how many multiple choice and then how many, what your scores would be on the exam, and I think the one I, I often used was you could get half the multiple choice right, and then you could get two sixes and a five and still end up with a score of three. Um, how that's going right. to change now, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm sure the College Board will have it up there very soon. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a lot here, so I think some of you got that answered. Um, those of you asking about the slides, a lot of people asking about the slides too. Uh, we will send a recording, and we will send the slides around um, when uh, tomorrow. Usually within 24 hours, we send them around. Um, so let us know if you have any questions. Um, it seems like I'm just trying to see if there's any um, ones that we can answer rather quickly. Um, Okay. Yeah, most, a lot of these ones coming in now are really about um, are really about finding the multiple choice and finding some of the things that Bedford's offering, um, and then some of the others for our authors that are more specific um, to things that you were talking about earlier. Uh, specific questions about um, some of the topics that you were talking about in terms of like what does spaces mean, and I, th I think that you um, either address them or would be better in an email. So um, oh, not a ton more here. Lisa, there's also on the um, on the Facebook page. The space is, is great, Megan. It's it's shorter, but I gather that Space Cat has become another acronym <laughs> that people are using. So everybody's trying to work with this exigence business here. Um, so, <laughs> but I like spaces. Um, yeah, I think there's there's more questions just about like what the passing qualifying is, and I think Larry, if you just want to comment on that, I think the thing is that we as non, um, you know, the people who develop the rubric, we just don't know yet. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that. They just seem, there seem to be some questions about, you know, when that information will be available. Well, th that specific information will not be available because the College Board um, will never say what a qualifying score is on the, you know, the essay rubric. It's only something that can be deduced. Um, we recognize that a six in the old form was adequate, and you know, with fives and sixes, the students could easily, you know, score a three. But what is qualifying? It's a, such a complicated combination of factoring the multiple choice and and the three uh, essay questions. I mean, I figured it out for myself more or less, and we'll do so over the next year for the for the new scoring, but that's all I can say about it's, that. Right, and it's also, there are two issues here, and the one is what the formula is, but then the other thing is that at the end of the reading, the psychometricians, the chief readers, and everybody get together, and there is a bell curve that they look at, so they, they don't have that yet. I mean, they haven't, they've yep. certainly worked on this extensively, but they haven't had a full reading yet where, where they can actually look at how everybody um, falls out on, on the scoring. So I, yeah, I think we're getting line. more and more information as time yeah. goes by. That dividing line Great. between the two and the three and the four and the five isn't determined until the end of each particular reading each year. As you said, it changes right. from year to year. Yes, the formula yeah. Yeah. Is, is going to be the yeah. same, and I don't know if they've revealed that yet. But they, but the, uh, but the actual um, dividing lines, as I said, are, are altered. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, two other quick things, just housekeeping, and also an answer to one quick question. Someone asked what Facebook page was referenced earlier. Um, I think what they were referring to is the um, non BFW sanctioned, but just the AP Literature and the AP Language um, Teacher Facebook pages or Facebook groups, and that's what was referenced. So for the person that asked about that. Um, and then for yeah. everyone else, I just sent a link out, hopefully, to everyone through both the chat and through the Q&A. So either way that you've been interacting with me, you should have gotten it. Um, that's our chain, that's our um, update page. Um, if you'll see it when you click through. It should say, we've got you covered. You just drop down the course that you're interested in. And then you go to the book that you're interested in, and below you'll see those pacing guides, the links to the multiple choice, and the videos, and any other documents that we have that help you get up to speed on things. 
Um, just a quick reminder, the, the multiple choice, we don't give those away, you know, for free publicly because your students would get them. So we basically direct you on how to get them. Um, and you need to find a rep and they'll give them to you. But I'm going to re repeat again, if you just email hsmarketing at bfwpub.com, we also can send you the link and we're happy to do so. Um, so I'll just send this one more time since folks are asking for the link, sending again. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining. I will send out the slides, the recording, and we'll also include the link to the site that I mentioned, the AP Update site, um, when we send the follow-up. And I also want to thank um, Larry and Renee and Megan for your time today. Um, I found it really helpful. I know a lot of people are sending messages of thanks. So thank you for being with us today. And I hope okay, everyone got you. some really helpful information. Take care. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. And we'll, we're going to be back next Thursday. <laughs> so right. we're talking we're about right. literature. Right. We'll see, right. We'll see you all there. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everybody.